Coming up against a state law requiring the city to sell off surplus school buildings, reforming government to make Milwaukee more business friendly, and looking for new ways to collect more than $147 million owed to the city by scofflaws. This is Council Rewind, and I'm Dustin Weiss. Delinquent taxes, fees, forfeitures, even $18 million in unpaid parking tickets. All of it adds up to more than $147 million that could be used to offset the taxes that law-abiding Milwaukeeans pay. Later in the program, city leaders take a new look at ways they could track down the scofflaws who owe that money and collect on it. But first, when state lawmakers put together their most recent budget, they included an unusual provision. Lawmakers who wrote the legislation wanted to be able to force the city to sell off unused school buildings to private owners who would use them to run charter, voucher, or private schools. Milwaukee public schools cannot be considered as a potential buyer under that law, which requires the city to solicit letters of interest from potential buyers. Then it's required to review the offers and close the deals within 60 days. So when the Judiciary and Legislation Committee met on March 22nd, it was for the purpose of approving a list of eligible buyers and creating the committee that would review offers. But it also sought important advice from the city attorney. If the council were not to take timely action, what are the potential repercussions? Well, first of all, let's indicate what timely action is. Um, under the, under 1961, the the clerk via DCD had to list the eligible buildings and give interested operator, uh, interested, interested education operators 28 days to submit letters of interest. That time ran on February 25th. Then for all buildings that had only one interested, interested education operator, the city has 60 days to complete the sale of that building. Okay. For those buildings that had 60 two, days starting when? Starting on tw uh, February 25th. So that ends on April 25th. For those buildings that had two or more interested education operators, the city has 50 days from the 25th of February to initiate the RFP uh, process and name the committee members that you're planning on naming today. And that is the second piece of legislation that Correct. we would have to determine if there are eligible operators um, at that point, a points-based system or a determination of of who the stronger operator would be. You asked about the potential impact if we don't act. Yes. I can tell you that there are organizations looking at what the council is doing and trying to assure that we are complying with the statute. Uh, and we have been advised that if the council doesn't follow the statute, that there will be litigation. Um, I would guess it would be in the nature of a mandamus to require or force the council to act under the statute. Grant, what organizations are threatening the city to us to perform litigation? We received a letter from an organization called Will. And Will? Will, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. Okay. Uh, and in that communication, they, indi they indicated, I think right at the end, the suggestion that they, are, they would consider litigation in the event the council doesn't comply with its statutory obligations. And what type of organization, what is their interest? They represent um, Risen Savior Lutheran Church or okay. school. But I believe they had some interest in um, the statute as a whole. Yeah, we're also in possession of a less sternly worded letter, um, but still urging a different kind of action from Milwaukee Public Schools, which are we representing them too in this, or is there a conflict there? How does that work? Because I know you normally represent MPS, Grant. Thank you, Martha. At least at this point, I don't see a conflict between the city and MPS. We have discussed that at length with them. They have retained outside counsel. Well, they have. In okay. the event there are conflict issues that arise, they will turn to outside counsel for advice. Right. So they're, but they, I, I assume you have this letter too, I think, from yesterday, where they urge, specifically they say, as the committee examines the issues and information before it at this meeting, the district urges you to pause and consider the consequences of moving too quickly with the sale of MPS schools. I certainly agree with that. Actually, 
in, in, the reasons I agree with that couldn't be firmer than the one stated by Alderman Stamper, which is th this is city-owned property that we're in the middle of creating redevelopment in neighborhoods that could be beneficial to everyone, including other nearby schools, because you'll get jobs, you'll get residents, you'll get you know future students at the other nearby schools. And then suddenly we are just completely hamstrung. I, I understand the spot you're in, Grant, where you have to tell us how to enforce the state law and you're explaining to us the spot we're in. So I don't like this spot one bit, but given that one of your clients, one of our partners, uh, Milwaukee Public Schools, is urging us to not move too quickly and I know has a different opinion than you do about, well, they want to qualify themselves and there's some other people that want to qualify. How much leeway do we, I mean, how firm is the 60-day clock if we, if you want to take the advice of Milwaukee Public Schools and and take a closer look at, and have the council take a closer look at some of these legal issues which are in dispute. I have not had a full discussion with their outside council about potential legal issues. We're gonna have that discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm satisfied that the advice that we're giving you is the correct advice. I haven't seen anything to suggest that the advice is incorrect, um, but I'm certainly willing to listen to MPS. Other than a, a, a writ of mandamus, um, is there the prospect that the city could incur any potential uh, um, damages for not concurring? I mean, do we face any prospects of of damages through litigation? Well, I hate to give you a firm answer on that, but I think it's unlikely. Okay. All right. Um, it may be if we don't complete a sale within the time frame that well, that's what I'm an talking organization about. Organization could could seek damages. Potentially. I mean, how do we avoid a situation where a choice school, charter school, you know, many of these are one-off operations. They have a board. They operate one property. Uh, somebody dies. Somebody files bankruptcy. Somebody leaves town. Somebody moves. And suddenly we have another abandoned five-acre site in the middle of a neighborhood that nobody can do anything about. I mean, how do we avoid that? Under the statute, we are allowed to um, include a reversionary clause where if whoever purchases the building does not turned it into the school within two years of the closing date, uh, we'll come back to the Is city. there ability to put a covenant or deed restriction on the title that says if at some point down the line, <clears throat> above and beyond a reversionary clause for noncompliance? I mean, th the statute says that these are for operators who intend to operate. And let's say in the case that Alderman Bauman is, is, is indicating, we had a situation where someone did just that but didn't make a go of it um, two, four years down the line. Um, if, if two, four years down the line, they have no interest in that property, they don't necessarily intend to sell it, but now they have that property to say, oh, our school didn't go, but we have an asset that we're just going to turn around and sell. Um, would we have the ability to have a, a, the first say it to place some type of restriction on that title to actually allow for the city to, to uh, return that to the city's fold. Well, under the statute, um, we are allowed. The, we're mandated to complete the sale of the eligible school building in, according with, in accordance with standard city practices. It's my understanding that for a lot of the buildings, we often include a right of first refusal in our sale contracts. So, I, if I guess if you wanted that to be in a contract, I'm pretty sure that would be in it. Do but we have Jeremy the authority to better. lease schools? Under the statute, no, yes. it's, it's selling. One of the things that are in our previous sale documents is giving the city of Milwaukee a right of first refusal if they have received a bona fide offer to purchase um, down the road, okay. um, which essentially they get the offer. They, they have a certain okay. period of time to give it to the city and we can match it or not. And if we choose not to, then they can sell it to. And is there any legislative intent on that? It's standard with our standard city practice. Right, so I, we would truly be imagining the thoughts of someone else if you were to declare legislative intent on that. 
So I, 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 I frankly, I, I'm a little upset that we haven't, well, maybe this is better for closed session, but there's a whole host of options we have here, and I don't like the answer being, well, we don't think that's what the state wanted. The state passed a law, we gotta read the law and we gotta follow the law. We don't have to imagine what they wanted. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I'll, I mean, I, I was prepared to support this, because particularly because I support the Penfield acquisition of Wisconsin Avenue School. That'll be a positive for the neighborhood. But as I'm listening to this confused discussion, I'm not so sure I support this at this point. I, I don't care about sales and first refusals. I care about schools that just shut down and, wa and they walk away. It happens, they don't offer it to anybody. They just, they just walk away, throw the key away and leave town. I want to know how do we get that property back and not paying them off for it. The only way is to be an absolute reversion for nothing in the event that school ceases operations. The answer is an appropriate deed restriction. That's Why wouldn't somebody say that in the first well, place? That's what I was asking about. So, so I mean, as long as as long as as the statutes don't prohibit us from placing that, I don't know that that goes against the intent of the legislature. The intent was to take what the legislature wanted to define in their own ways was an expendable building. They may or may not have been, um, but in in their according to their guidelines and definitions, were an expendable building, and to provide it to a wanton user who is an educational operator of a K through 12 program. Um, if that if that does not happen, um, or it ceases to happen at some point, I don't know that. Uh, un unless you know we get word otherwise that we would be prohibited from having the ability to regain that property um unless now cat out of the bag you know i don't know that when the legislature's next in session i think they're done for a while but that may be first on their list of the hit list of on here in milwaukee down the line um but i but if we do move forward with this i think it would be in our in our best interest to place such a restriction in. What would happen if we just leased Wisconsin Avenue School to Penfield for 25 years? Period, we leased it. And then fine, come and sue us. The school is operating, they're a choice school, they're a charter school, they're functioning, they're in there. They have a long-term lease so they can do their financing, they can do their improvements. We get sued, fine. It's a, the intent of the statute has been satisfied. A private school is using an MPS facility. The intent is classically satisfied. Let them sue us. No. But under a lease, we retain the ultimate control to get the property back seamlessly without reversions and out deed restrictions, which, as I have found dealing with deed restrictions on homes that have owner occupancy requirements, we either never enforce them or they're difficult to enforce because fee, fee title has passed. With a lease, there, there's no issues. I mean, what, so, we get, so then we get sued. There is a statutory provision on our ability to lease a building for that mm -hmm. purpose, but no, it's limited no. to 15, 14, 14 years. 14 years. So we've got options. I want to explore them. I don't like the idea that we have to just hurry up and enforce a statute that on its face doesn't make sense. Now, it could be we explore those options, and we really are, our, our hands are as tied as our council is currently implying. But I'm not satisfied we've truly, in good faith, explored all of our real options. So we're going to work with you. With, so just because we didn't follow this weird, circuitous, counter the definition of actual words route that the state is trying to mandate us to do, we may do it in an actual reasonable way. And the state may go, actually, well, that's what we wanted. Never, this statute was pretty ridiculously written anyway, and no judge will enforce it. Or maybe not. Maybe it doesn't matter, and, and we will, our hands are as tight as we are. But just, just so that the, uh, and you better not respond to that <laughs> but, uh, but that you know so I, I don't think moving moving to hold doesn't um, it just gives us time to explore options that I am kind of disappointed we haven't explored up to this point the committee met again in special session but didn't reach any decision on the issue when a scofflaw doesn't pay off a city parking ticket the city notifies the DMV and they can in turn suspend the driver's registration but that doesn't necessarily get the city any closer to collecting the money that's owed. And when other unpaid fees and forfeitures are tallied up, that's $147 million that could go toward lowering the taxes of people who follow the rules. On March 21st, the Judiciary and Legislation Committee met to discuss new tactics for collecting debt. This outstanding 
debt work group will look at money owed the city of Milwaukee, which according to the Comptroller's latest report is $147 million in outstanding fines and fees. Uh, the, uh, the last time we did this was 2005. Uh, we looked at money owed to the city. It turned out there was actually nobody watching the hen house here at all. Uh, there was no accounting for outstanding debt. One of the uh, results of that task force was to cause an annual report like this, this uh, one from the controller, which I'll distribute uh, to us annually to at least see where we were. Uh, there still is no official uh, department looking at outstanding debt. Uh, at the present time, it's $147 million, according to the controller's last, last report. Uh, the task force that we had back in 2005 tried to unify our debt collection, bring people up, find out who owed what, find out what departments were doing to bring in the debt, uh, increase the knowledge of those departments, uh, we made recommendations for departments to follow, uh, which after a series of hearings, every six, month we had, six months we had a hearing to see how they were doing, uh, and they eventually all did the same thing. Uh, so we began to use different techniques. Since that time, things have changed. For one, there, I got word that indeed the contracts for our collections firm collection firms were expiring and that we needed to look at this, that there were problems with them. Uh, one of the handouts I'll give you here is the, uh, the rates for the four different groups that we're working with, and you'll see that they charge anywhere from 4.9 for trip collection up to 20% for trip collection. Seems to be the same task. Uh, this group, work group will look at things like that. We will look at the uh, possibility of selling uncollected debt to a third party, collectors, rather than just writing it off. Writing it off was uh, uh, something recommended in the last task force. Uh, it seems that selling, it, selling unpaid debt is uh, to a third party to go out and collect is something that's more prevalent these days than it was then. In 2009, the Wisconsin Department of Revenue got power to collect delinquent taxes, forfeitures, judgments, and fees, and now does that for 100 municipal governments throughout the state of Wisconsin. Should we be using that, and what kind of debt do we want to send to them? Uh, we can have our choice. Is it out of state debt? Is it uh, debt from out of the city, outside our city borders? I'll also hand out a piece from the uh, DPW about outstanding debt uh, as far as parking citations goes. And there's 30 million outstanding, 19 million of it uh, with registration, with there's three million of it out state. Another two million have, have registrations uh, on their vehicle, that is. And the state may be in better shape to collect this than we are. At bottom line, this would, this would uh, bring us up to date to where we are now, uh, to what the state of the art is, at least. Look at this total picture, uh, examine where we are, what can be done, what the state of the art is today, and report back by July 31st, which is prior to the two of the contracts expiring with vendors. And the question has to be raised, should we have these vendors at all? Uh, should we be turning it over to the state? So it'll look at all kinds of issues. Uh, it has uh, a wide variety. It has the departments involved, three aldermen involved, the controller's office, specifically related to this, and I'd like to thank uh, Alderman Witkowski because he has been punching forward on receivables for as long as I've been in office, and we have come a long way uh, since I started in 2012. 
but I would ask for more time, um, not to be done by the end of July, but actually maybe October, if that's at all possible. And the reason I'm asking for more time is because within my own office, it's going to be hard for me to dedicate a resource given all the other things we need to have accomplished by July 31st. Mr. Chairman, with Go regard ahead. to uh, extending the time, I have no, extent, no trouble coming back and extending the time uh, should the committee decide that they needed it at that point in time. Okay. Uh, as that, that can be done for, by immediate adoption at a council meeting. Okay. But I, I think we're in a little bit of a rush to uh, uh, give us the best bargaining power with the, any firms that we would be hiring with the expiring contracts. The measure passed with the unanimous support of the Common Council. And finally, like any government entity, the City of Milwaukee has heard from local entrepreneurs about the ease of doing business with the city. From regulations to permits, the city has its fair share of red tape, intended to make this a better place to live and work. But this is the 21st century, and so the council created the Local Business Action Team to review city code and make it more business friendly. On March 18th, city departments reported to the Steering and Rules Committee their progress on implementing LBAT's recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This uh, report is the result of the work group form to look, look at how we do business here in the city with city of Milwaukee with regard to uh, getting new businesses and uh, uh, being competitive with surrounding suburbs and any other unit of government. Uh, work group did uh, come in with a report six months ago. Uh, came in with a slew of recommendations and action, and uh, this is the first of what should be uh, every six-month report as to how are we progressing. Uh, this was a group that was multi-jurisdictional and intended to look at really the whole range of city services and products, and each of us has provided something to the file. Ours comes in the format of our business and service improvement project, which we've come to call Red Tape Rescue. Uh, we're very, very happy for what the uh, LBAT was able to offer and to send us forward with, and we're just taking it in this other direction. We are right now in the process of completing hiring of a bilingual individual at the front end of our licensed division. Uh, this is something we've lacked and something we've heard consistent feedback about. In addition, we're getting ready and we're entering into communications with the library and other city agencies to put out a, a remote license division station at public libraries as well as other public city facilities so individuals don't have to come downtown if they want to engage on those issues. Um, we also wanted to stress that we are not focused entirely on the licensing process, although there's an awful lot of that that we find here uh, we are also looking at some of the other divisions through an amendment that was made by Alderman Hamilton in the budget. The City Records Center is not part of the Office of the Common Council City Clerk. When it was taken over, we discovered that it was open on a consistent basis only two days a week. Uh, we know that there are individuals that want to come down there to receive plans and receive documents. And so very, very shortly, uh, without any additional allocation of resources, we're getting ready to open it five days a week so that people who want to come down there and view those plans can do that. Similarly, uh, once we have completed our full hire down in the license division, uh, we are prepared to begin offering for the first time evening hours for individuals who want to come down. Probably looks to be on Thursday. Individuals who want to come down and apply for licenses here at City Hall after hours until as late as we're hoping it'll be about 8 p.m. Um, so we're going to be doing that. The thing that, that we're the most exciting, excited about is the opportunity to work with other agencies on collaborative efforts. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Navigator, pro the Business Navigator, that is a joint effort of just about everybody you see sitting in front of you um, that's partially funded by a grant from the Small Business Administration. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Brown, Martha Brown, asked me to bring this to your attention. We are hoping, this is a product, if you are an individual in this city, and I know this was something that Alderman Wachowski was very concerned about. If you are an individual in this city who is hoping to open, let's say, in a mixed-use historic property and you want a food dealer's license as well as a liquor license, you have this series of hurdles you hope... Or a that sidewalk cafe. With a sidewalk cafe. God for a fan. Yeah, let's throw everybody in. <laughs> and, and, and if you want to do all those different things, that's a lot of stuff. And we are hoping to build, and it's going to be a long process. I don't want to kid anybody.
money, because these are complicated things. But we are hoping to build in the form of this navigator a piece of software that an individual who opens to open those businesses can go to and go through a series of questions, as detailed as they need to be, so that at the beginning, they can see what they need to do to work through each step of our bureaucracy. And as much as is possible, I'll let them apply for those pieces right there online. Uh, as, as Jim alluded to, the Acela system or land management system, um, we've expended a significant amount of resources uh, over the last several months in development and implementation of that. Uh, these are going to deal with several of the business improvement uh, uh, initiatives that was, were identified in the original report, such as electronic plan submittal, uh, online project tracking, and uh, the ability for uh, uh, folks to check on their um, make applications for certificates of occupancy and interdepartmental management and tracking of development projects are all going to be lumped into that that Acela project and and uh, we're excited about that we already have a, a, a hub of it uh, active in the development center dealing with DPW permits and working out some of the challenges that that uh, a new any new system is going to bring to bear um, the development center has at this time allocated space to the health department and we're looking forward to the, that enhanced relationship. And in, in terms of coordinating um, inspectors to go out to establishments when they're doing remodeling or expanding their business, what is the coordination right now between the health department and DNS uh, those inspections? You know, I don't have a good answer for you at this time, but I certainly will take a look at it. Um, I think they're independent and they, they are um, disjointed at this point, but I, I'm sure that there would be an improvement. Is there something in particular that you're I reaching for? You, yeah, I think you said it very well. It, it's disjointed. So when somebody's spending money in the city of Milwaukee to expand their business, um, they don't want to hear from somebody saying it's disjointed. Uh, they want to say that it's going to be coordinated and that, that when they hire a contractor, they don't have to wait two weeks for the inspector from one department and an inspector from another department to meet with them while the work is put in hold. So I think when there's coordination and there's the ability to do things where we make it easier and friendlier for people to do business in Milwaukee. There were recommendations within the report that, that we are... Um, uh, in the process of carrying out as they are listed as under uh, underway or not quite uh, done, but one was to to create a new coordinator position and to to expedite that we look to reclassify uh, one of our uh, food inspector positions to have the capacity to be in the development center full time and and while that process is hopeful uh, to be completed by mid-April as we work with employee relations to to do that reclassification we haven't uh, we haven't stopped the work moving forward we are training our coordinators right now because they'll be rotating through so that we'll always have uh, support in that and 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 that uh, development center uh, we did uh, do a zoning change that uh, you guys passed last uh, late summer that makes it easier for um, uh, food production and for alcohol uh, production, uh, microbreweries, uh, mini distilleries, et cetera. That's uh, proved pr quite successful. Uh, it's a very big booming sort of a thing and we're cutting you know, basically the red tape regarding those. We have a number of other uh, zoning changes that we're constantly looking at in ways to try and you know, make the city more business friendly. And uh, I'm at this time I'm taking the kind of the list of stuff that we couldn't get to last year and I'm trying to work up another batch of, of proposed changes. Uh, one of the other things that's highlighted in uh, Martha Brown's letter is that uh, uh, we just passed the um, creation of a zoning district called IC or industrial commercial. This is something that was requested by the business people on uh, St. Paul Avenue uh, in conjunction with Menominee Valley Partners as part of efforts that uh, the department did in creating the Men Menominee Valley 2.0 plan. Uh, this basically uh, creates some flexibility in an area that was totally zoned just straight industrial. It allows for some commercial uses and it kind of sets up a, a showroom kind of district. Again, this is something that was really driven by the, the businesses in that area um, for that and you know we look forward to do more, doing more of that sort of thing in the okay. years to come. The report was placed on file. That's a look back at some of the important issues from the most recent Common Council cycle. For the City Channel and Council Rewind, I'm Dustin Weiss.